Positive heads out there. Thanks for tuning your beautiful brainwaves into another episode of the Positive Head Podcast, where we are firmly convinced that creating success and happiness is rooted in understanding the ultimate nature of reality. And the fact that as human beings, we are all immensely powerful fractals of the one and only source consciousness, which creates and animates all things. Now, of course, understanding this powerful truth is one thing. Applying this incredibly empowering wisdom to everyday life, well, that's another. Which is exactly why we provide you with a fresh serving of soul food for thought five days a week. To help constantly remind you of what matters most. You are it. And I'm your host for the day, Erica Middlemiss. I am just another reflection and extension of you who will be here filling in for our beloved host, Brandon Beecham, leading the way to ensure your perspective is consistently expanded, your vibration is constantly elevated, and your heart is overflowing and full. All right, all you positive heads, welcome. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me today. So last night I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today and I had this idea about continuing what I talked about on Tuesday, which was listening to our higher self. And I thought today we would talk about the concept of really embodying our higher self and starting to really think in the big picture, the way our higher self sees it, the way our inner being sees it, and the way source sees it. From this higher perspective, from the bird's eye view, the view of above the maze and not within it. So seeing the big picture from the big me perspective, and it's really helpful to be able to do this because how many of you out there are stressed? Or pretty much stress is kind of like a common thing for all of us, isn't it? Life is stressful. And the more we allow it to stress us out, the more stressful it becomes. So how do we work around all of this stress, the stress of our work environment, our home environment, the stress of our bodies even? Well, you know, one big thing is the fact that we're stressed at all is what's stressing our bodies for one. But how do we work with this? How do you see the big picture in these stressful moments? First of all, just reminding yourself that there is a bigger picture in these moments. These moments when you're maybe grief stricken. Maybe, for example, there's been a death in the family and I'll just give you an example from my own family. My my uncle was sick for years. He had heart problems and he was pretty bad off. And let's just say he was miserable. Eventually, he passed away and it was very difficult on his children, my cousins. And... The big picture for them to see in this was that their dad is no longer suffering. He no longer feels that intense pain every single day. He is now at peace. That's the big picture there. If they could see that over the thought of their own loss how they miss him, which is so understandable. We miss our loved ones when they go. But the fact that he's not suffering has to come above your own need to have him here because to have him here would continue his suffering. And that's not right, is it? Just for your own needs. No, so the bigger picture is he is happy now. He is not suffering anymore. And I know that that's hard to do in the middle of a grief situation, but 
if we can just remind ourselves that there is this big picture and try to see it, it is very helpful. And that's not to say that we don't feel our grief because it's important to experience it and go through those feelings. Feel them and then eventually release them and move on. So times of stress will always stress our bodies. So it's really important that we learn how to use our will to be able to change our minds in these situations because we create all of our own stress in our minds. We are such powerful, powerful beings. Dolores Cannon always says, if we can make ourselves sick, then we can make ourselves well. And so many of us are making ourselves so sick every day with worry and stress. And for what? It's this anxiety about what we really have no control of, the past or the future. So we need to learn how to use our minds properly so that we don't have to have this accumulation of weight that this stress puts on our bodies, on our minds and within our energy field. And I know that was a really kind of big example with death and so many of our stresses are just the daily the daily routine am I going to get to work on time what if this person at work is going to say something nasty again or you know this project is this project is not done and and I got to get it done there's so many things to stress about we have control over all of that in our minds And it takes a lot of practice, but it is our greatest power. It can also be our biggest weakness if we let it, if we let that monkey just continue to roll on its hamster wheel in our conscious mind, giving it free reign to just continue to do whatever it wants. But we have control over our thoughts. There's a really great book on this concept written by Neville Goddard called The Power of Awareness. And actually, Brandon read this book back at like 357, I think, 358. There was a few a few episodes where he read this book. I had actually given him this book when we first met and I started working here at the podcast years ago at this point. Um, but such a great book. I definitely recommend picking that up or listening to those episodes because he talks about how powerful our imagination is and how we can use our minds to create our reality. And one of my favorite things to talk about is the fact that we ourselves are the gadgets. We don't need There's so many gadgets out there, all these things that can, you know, work with our energy fields or even crystals or all fine and good, but you are the gadget. You have all of this power within you. You are the reflection of light, that light of source that is ever powerful. You have the power of your mind to focus this light and do with it whatever you want as long as you are open to those possibilities. The stresses of life, all that does is just dampen that power and weigh us down and we have control over that. So here's what's cool about how this episode came about today. So I was thinking about this concept of thinking like our higher self all the time from this higher perspective because that's really helpful to, um, you know, take on the, that power in our minds, right? Understanding that we are this big, powerful being, really, and that this ego, small self is just the illusion. Um, so I was looking for a YouTube clip of seeing the big picture. I came across an Alan Watts clip who I really enjoy, and I listened to a whole hour of this clip, and... Um, decided that it wasn't exactly where I was going. And so then I decided to scrap it and that I would just do something else today. And I thought, Joe Dispenza, and he just kind of came to me. So 
that was my higher self saying to me, hey, go check out Joe Dispenza, right? So I always listen to that, that bigger me talking to me. So I go check out Joe Dispenza and there is a clip that was just posted yesterday, of course, which is awesome. And he's talking about exactly this. Not exactly in these words of your higher self, but this is exactly the concept he's talking about. And I found this on the Success Archive webpage. It's called Joe Dispenza, One of the Most Eye-Opening Speeches. Take a listen. If your thoughts can make you sick, can your thoughts make you well? So then, the hormones of stress, though, give the body and brain a rush of energy. And it's like a narcotic. It becomes a drug. And people become very addicted to the adrenaline and the stress hormones. And they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their emotional addiction so they can remember who they think they are. The bad relationship, the bad job, the terrible circumstances, all of that is in place because the person needs that to reaffirm their emotional addiction. Because God forbid they couldn't feel anything. So then if the hormones of stress become like a narcotic and you can turn on the stress response just by thought alone, then we could become addicted to our own thoughts. How many people are still with me? So then if you become addicted to your own thoughts when it, becomes, when it comes time to change, then you can understand then, just like an addict, the moment you're no longer thinking certain thoughts that are making certain chemicals for you to feel a certain way, and those feelings drive the same thoughts, you know, like if you have an insecure thought, you begin to feel insecure, right? Come on. And the moment you feel insecure, you're going to think more insecure thoughts, yes? And if you keep doing that for 20 or 30 years, it's going to feel pretty familiar, yeah? And then you're going to say, I am insecure. Well, whenever you say, I am anything, what you're saying is you're commanding your mind and body towards a destiny. So if the body has been conditioned to the mind of insecurity, don't you think then the moment you're no longer going to think insecure thoughts and fire and wire those circuits in your brain and then produce the blend of chemicals for you to feel that way, don't you know your body is going to do what? It's going to look back up at your brain and say, hey, I modified my receptor sites for you. We've been doing this for 20 years. I'm counting on those chemicals coming. Now you're just going to stop? And it's going to start sending signals back to the brain. And the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. And so these people understood that their 20 years of hatred or their 30 years of anger or their 15 years of fear or insecurity was the very reason that they were sick. And because feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences and we can remember experiences better because we can remember how they feel, if uh, the environment signals the gene and the environment produces a chemical reaction, then as long as you're feeling the same way every single day, there's no new information coming from the environment and you keep signaling the same gene. How many people are with me? So then the emotions of anger and aggression and hurt and hostility and hatred and prejudice and fear and anxiety and insecurity and hopelessness and powerlessness and depression, guilt and shame, those are all familiar emotions to us because we've experienced the events correlated with them. How many people are still with me? And it's those emotions that are derived from the hormones of stress. And if you keep knocking your body out of balance, that imbalance becomes the new balance and you're headed for some type of disease. And these people began to realize that they had to change that. And when we react to something or someone in our life, there's always a change in our chemical state. We're altered in some way. And if you don't know how to control your emotional reaction to that event in your life, and that chemical refractory period continues for hours or days, that's called a mood. 
What's wrong with you? I'm in a mood. Oh, really? Why? Thought you'd never ask. Well, this thing happened to me five days ago. And I'm living by the same emotional reaction. Now, if you keep that refractory period going on for weeks or months, that's called a temperament. Why is he so angry? I don't know. Why are you so angry? Well, this experience happened to me nine months ago. And I'm living by the same emotional reaction. One long refractory period. And if you keep it going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And most people wear their emotions layer by layer. And they believe that's who they are. And there was an article in Scientific American just two months ago that scientists said that 50% of what you say about your past is not true. Because you're not the same person. You make up stuff. And so then, if feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences... Now, stay with me. Did Greg say we need to think differently? Yes? So how many people in this audience believe that the way you think has something to do with your life? You do, yes? Okay, so feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences, yes? You can remember experiences better because you can remember how they feel, yes? So then, if you can't think greater than how you feel, or feelings have become the means of thinking, are you thinking in the future or are you thinking in the past? And as long as you're thinking in the past, what are you creating more of? Quantum model of reality still applies. And so, if you're feeling the same way every single day, then according to our biological model, it means nothing new is happening in your life. Is that right? Because how many potentials exist in the quantum field? How many? So with every new experience, there should be a pretty good emotion, right? You should feel overjoyed or in awe and wonder or excited, or inspired, or in gratitude, or appreciation. An elevated emotion. But living by those same familiar emotions means nothing new is happening in your life. And the body as the unconscious mind, as long as we're living in the same familiar feelings, is believing it's in the same past experience, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And if the bodies become the mind of that emotion, then the body literally is living in the past. And we can't create a new future holding on to the emotions of the past. So these people began to realize that no one or nothing was worth it. And that the hormones of stress endorse the ego for us to become selfish. Because when an animal is threatened, by something in its external environment. The job of the organism in emergency and survival is to take care of the self. And we identify the self as a body in the environment and in time. When the zebra is being chased by the lion, she's only concerned about three things. Her body, like I better take care of this, so I better put my attention on it. The environment, where am I gonna go? And how much time do I have to get there? And when you and I live by the cocktail of those stress hormones, we obsess about our bodies, our hairstyle, our face, our weight, our problems, things in our environment, things we have, things we don't have, and we obsess about time. But that's not who you are. Because as long as you're living by the hormones of stress, you're living as a materialist because the hormones of stress cause us to believe that the outer world is more real than the inner world. And those hormones absolutely make us feel separate from possibility. Why? Because when you're being chased by a lion, it's not time to create. It's not time to trust. It's not time to learn. It's time for emergency. The majority of people in the Western world spend the majority of their time preparing themselves for the worst case scenario and protecting themselves from it. They're basically trying to predict the future from the past. And you know, when we get it right, you know what we say, right? You need to hang out with me. See how smart I am? But what happens when it doesn't happen? 
That's called anxiety. It's called neurosis. It's called insomnia. And so when we live by the hormones of stress and we're defining reality by our senses, we become materialists because we feel separate from possibility and all of our attention goes on our bodies, the environment, and time. Another way to say that is, from a quantum perspective, the atom is 99.9999% energy and information. And we're putting all of our attention on the particle. And we're missing out on possibility. And so these people had to hit a point of crisis where they finally started taking their attention off their outer world and started to ask themselves some bigger questions. Who am I? What is a greater expression of myself? What would I have to change to be happy? Who in history do I admire that I want to be like? And they began to contemplate and speculate and rehearse who they were going to be if they got better. And the mere process of thinking about who they were going to be began to change their brain. And when you marry a clear intention, intention is a thoughtful process, with an elevated emotion, that's a heartfelt process, you move into a new state of being. And as they began to remind themselves every single day of who they no longer wanted to be, and they reminded themselves every day of who they did want to be, they began to cause their brain to fire in new sequences and new patterns and new combinations. And whenever you make your brain work differently, you're changing your mind. Because according to neuroscience, mind is the brain in action. Mind is the brain at work. So, it's all about using our minds in the most effective way. And we have complete control over this once we understand what it is that we're doing. Once we can learn to see that bigger picture. I loved how he quoted unknowingly probably Dolores Cannon. If your thoughts can make you sick, they can also make you well. I've seen this so often in practice and uh, it is so, so, so true. It is the reason why I now focus on working with basically the mind instead of the body because the mind is what is telling the body what to do. Like you just heard him talk about, all of this stress creates these hormones that act like a drug that our bodies become dependent on. And then the more we become dependent on these emotions, they become, I mean, the longer that we keep them, they can become personality traits. If we allow this emotion to rain for years. These emotions that we carry that make us sick. Those emotions that are derived from stress. The one thing he said that I didn't quite agree with is, and this is just a little thing, but I'd like to point it out because I think it's important, about controlling emotions. So I don't think it's good to control, quote unquote, control any emotion. I think it's really important to look at our emotions open-heartedly from a bigger perspective. Accept those emotions for what they are. Feel them. Try to find the balance in it, right? And then move on. By controlling it, it's almost a way of suppressing it. And that just further enhances the problem. So that's not what we want to do. It's really important to give it some time and learn to accept it and find that balance. But we got to let it go, right? So that's the distinguishing point for me. Um, if we continue over and over to live in these old emotions that make us sick, then we start believing that that's exactly who we are. But what if... You can think greater than you can feel, like he said. What if you can stop thinking in the past and start thinking more of the bigger picture of your future? Because there is infinite potential in the quantum field. 
infinite. That's what the audience said if you didn't catch it. They, the answer was infinite. So with all of our new experiences that we have in life, we can actually allow them to be new. We can be grateful for them, feel some sort of elated emotion instead of being stuck in the feelings in our past that are creating that same experience now. The experience now can be however you choose it to be. You always have that choice now. So the body really becomes the mind of that emotion and literally will live in the past unless you decide to change your mind. And the biggest point he made there that nobody, nobody and nothing is worth this kind of stress that you put on yourself. The hormones that our body creates from these stressful thoughts put us in that mode of being the zebra being chased by the lion. I really like that analogy because in that scenario, no, you, you're not being creative. You're worried about survival. And that point he made about that making us materialists, that, that makes us focus on our bodies, our environment, and on our time. And it makes us believe that our outer world is more real than our inner world. It makes us feel separate from all of the infinite possibilities that are out there. So if we're constantly in this emergency mode, then we don't create. We don't keep ourselves open to the possibilities. I love that he made the point about the atom being 99.9% space or energy. And we're over here focusing on the particle, the the 0.1%, totally missing out on all of that possibility of the 99.9% of all that energy. Because we're focused on this little tiny thing in the external that we think is actually so huge. All the goods is inside. All of that power, all of that energy. So when we can take the attention away from that exterior, from that material, from that particle, and we can ask those bigger questions, the who am I and what is this greatest and grandest version of myself and what do I have to do in order to be that? You know, asking your higher self, calling upon your higher self, help me be this. I am this. Help me embody it. Use your imagination. Rehearse it like he said. With that clear intention plus the elevated emotion, that's how you move into a new state of being. Clear intention and elevated emotion. That's where all the power is. Intention and emotion. You will create an entirely new state of being for yourself and therefore an entirely new external reality as well. Remember everybody, you are the gadget. You don't need a gadget or a tool or a crystal or a healer or anything because you are it. This power is yours. With that, everyone, I am out of here for today. I'm going to leave you with a song. This song reminds us to not carry stones in our bowl of light, the bowl of light that we are. This is Trevor Hall, Bowl of Light. Until next time, everyone, love you all.
let that spirit roam Thread it through the thunder Let the sky melt sing Through that black night rainbow Mother spoke to me Don't you carry stones 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 in your bowl of light Don't you carry stones in your bowl of 